All right, now we can actually get the lecture started. We have some more examples. So how do we handle more complicated branches? We have more than one branch. Does that change our rules really at all? Not really, just we just have to specify add more than one prefix. Or if it's two of the two of the same size. Um, two branches of the same size, like this one, our longest continuous carbon chain here is still five, right? It still has a one carbon branch, well, it has two one carbon branches, right? Either, both of those branches are a methyl group. So it's still pentane. Our parent molecule is still pentane, it's still five continuous carbons. Dimethyl. And then, since it's two methyls though, and it's in the second like area, you don't have to say two dimethyl pentane, right? We do because. If you're in the second area, like, yes, exactly. That's also dimethyl pentane, yeah. isn't it? So it's two dimethyl pentane. Not just two dimethyl pentane. Two two. Two two dimethyl pentane. If you have to specify dimethyl, you need to put two numbers in front of it. If we had this molecule, we'd have to specify it'd be trimethyl, and we'd have to put three numbers in front of it. This would be three two three three dimethyl pentane. So this one that I have circled here would be two two dimethyl pentane. Two, three, three, trimethyl and then. And so it's a really versatile system because once you know how to do that, there's not really any limits to how many prefixes you can throw onto a molecule. We're not, it's not like the English language. We're kind of basing it around the way we do prefixes in the English language, but we're not really limited to, um, you know, making it a single word that makes sense like we are in English, right? Um, it's a little bit anti-disestablishmentarianism, right? Keep throwing prefixes and suffixes onto an English word and it keeps amending it. We're just going to keep doing the same thing here. All right, what's our longest continuous carbon chain here? Six. One, two, three, four, five, six, or five, six. Either way, it's going to be hexane. So, Start by circling our parent molecule. We have two branches that are not the same size now. So we just add, instead of saying dimethyl, we say we've got a methyl group and an ethyl, and an ethyl group. So it's tri, no, it's three, three ethyl, three methyl. Sorry, three ethyl, right? So depending on which way you start Wait, counting, yeah, it's carbon three and carbon four, no matter which way you start counting, right? So it doesn't really matter because it's either going to be three methyl, four ethyl, or three ethyl, four methyl. And again, the main goal with these is to make sure that somebody who knows the rules would would one hundred percent draw the correct molecule if they had the name. That's what we mean by unambiguous. There's no room for interpretation. So it doesn't really matter if you say three methyl, four ethyl, or three ethyl, four methyl. It doesn't matter which way. We're just keeping the numbers as close to zero as we can, but it doesn't really matter which way we start counting. 
If the methyl group was here, then it would make a difference. Because we could either have two and four, or we could have three and five. Yeah, is it the methyl group is are you using three and four because those are the parts of the branch that they come off of? I think those are the points. Yeah. Yeah, so this is part of one, two, yeah. three. Okay. So it's going to be three methyl, four ethyl, hexane. So same basic molecule. I just shifted the methyl over one spot, right? It's still going to be hexane. But now it matters which end we count from. Right? Because if we count from this side, it'll be three ethyl, five methyl. But if we count from the other side, it's two methyl, four ethyl. And it's always better to keep the numbers as low as possible. If you follow that rule, keeping the numbers as low as possible, that'll actually help you with one of the other types of questions that I can ask, which is, are these the same molecule or two different ways, or two different molecules, or uh, the same molecule drawn two different ways? So this, though, this one and the last one we looked at are, uh, if I drew it, let's see, Is that the same molecule as this one, or is that a different molecule? Same. How do you know? Because the they're at the same spot. Yeah, two and four in the same. Like you get, if you count from the lowest, if you keep the numbers as low as possible, if you name this using our same rules, you get the same name. If you get the same name, it's the same molecule. Our longest continuous carbon chain is still six. No matter how you draw it, or which six in a row you circle, you've still got a methyl on carbon two, ethyl on carbon four. All right, what about if we have a more complicated chain? So let's see. One, two, three. There. What's our longest continuous carbon chain on this molecule? It takes a little bit of practice to find that, and sometimes it takes several tries. Start counting at one end. You can see, I think it's eight. Oh, you're counting from up there. Once we go all the way. She's a different color. Hang on. Oh, wait. I, I didn't actually use it. Not Yeah. You draw. You draw. Yeah. 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 We count them one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So what's our parent molecule here? Octane. We have a single branch coming off of the octane, right? But it's a complicated branch, meaning it's not one straight chain coming off of the main group. Would it be like ethyl di methyl or, or methyl diethyl? Or Close. Our longest continuous carbon chain coming off of a branch, we have to call this carbon one. 
because that's the part that's directly attached to the branch. Oh. So that's a propyl group. But our propyl group has a branch on it. That's why we use the parentheses. So one is that whole. Yeah, and then we have a methyl group on our propyl group. And a methyl group could go actually on one of two places on a propyl group, if you're on carbon one or on carbon two. So we are still good. we're going to use our number numbering system too, just like you thought, Lucas. Sorry, one. I can I can count the one. And then we put the parentheses around this to say that this one methyl is applying to the propyl. So just like we do in math, we use parentheses to say, do this first. Everything in the parentheses is its own substituent, is its own branch. And then we're just going to say, this entire thing, regardless of what's inside of it, we're going to ignore what's inside of it and just say where this complicated branch is, which is on... <clears throat> How we indicate where that is. Let's see, if we start counting from up here, it'd be one, two, three, four, five, or if we count down from down here. One, two, three, four. So we want to count from the bottom, call this carbon one. So it'd be four. Parentheses one methyl propyl close parentheses octane. When we got to the bottom, because you want to that number to be the smallest. Exactly. So whichever takes the least amount of steps to get there, use the exact amount of inversion. Exactly. So because you could make it still make it octane by instead of going down that curve, just going straight across like the, the straightest line, could you also call this yes. like Three methyl four propyl octane. Yes, I meant to make it one that was long enough that you couldn't do that, but I should have made this just a single carbon then instead of a propyl. Um, yes, a more a simpler name would be if we start just counted one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Because now we have two branches, but they're both simple branches. So if you have to use the parentheses, I call that a complicated branch or complex branch because it's a branch within a branch, right? This has two branches, not just one, but they're both simple branches. So this might actually be easier to name it that way. It's not really wrong either way. Um, this is probably the better name though. If we if we count this way, um, how would we name it if we use the green circle part? Green nipple or purple octane. So it's still going to be octane, and it'd be yeah, three methyl. Uh, four propyl octane. Both of these are, are valid names in this case because they both have the same longest continuous carbon chain. You can only pick and choose how to do it if you can get your longest continuous carbon chain the same, uh, if it's the same number, depending on how you count it. Like if we went a different way, like if I didn't have that one wasn't there, then counting this direction would only get us to seven. And our longest continuous carbon chain would be counting this way, which would be eight. We don't have a choice then. But your longest continuous carbon chain means you have to have a complicated branch. You have to have a complicated branch. But occasionally there's two equally valid ways of getting to the same number. Get to eight, two different ways here which technically either of these names is valid. 
because they're both unambiguous. One molecule, ideally, there should be a one that be one molecule always gives the same name. But what's more important is that one name always gives you the right molecule. So the way that organic chemistry really works is instead of like, okay, we get this topic, now we're gonna move on to a new, a new chapter like we do in gen chem. Um, in organic chemistry, we just keep adding layers of complexity. We'll add new types of molecule to new types of atoms in. So we're not just dealing with hydrocarbons. We'll add new types of reactions in. We're we'll talking about reactions. Um, and it's, so it's, it's never like, um, we're on, into a totally new area. It's always building upon the same base. Um, so the next wrinkle that we add is halogens. Halogens are really easy, um, really easy atom type. We're going to get it off. I have a definition for it in a, in a few slides, but basically. Um, anytime you start from an alkane, if you add another wrinkle to how it's going to behave, something that's more, more complex than just a single saturated alkane, we call that a functional group. It's a functional group is anytime you've got a collection of atoms or one atom that's going to behave a certain way. So halogens are considered as a functional group because you put a, if you put a halogen on an alkane, that molecule now acts differently. It's going to react slightly differently and have different properties. And after we add halogens, we're just going to start talking about, okay, well, what about pi bonds? And then we're going to say, well, what about oxygens? What about nitrogens? All of those are just different functional groups, but they're also building on the same framework of here's a bunch of carbons and hydrogens. Everything needs to have the right number of bonds. So this is the first functional group we usually add is a halogen because halogens, you still, you indicate them with the prefix U. And basically how many halogen or how many bonds is a halogen going to need? They want the full valence. They, want the they both want full valence. We need to get to eight electrons. What does that mean as far as one. they want one, one bond it's in order to have a formal charge of zero? It's one over. How long it to be in that seventh column? Yes. Seven, right? Column 17. One, one away from the noble gases. That, that <laughs> column is called the halogens. Fluorine, fluorine, bromine, iodine, acetine, technically, but nobody uses acetine because it's radioactive and hard to find. Um, so, in general, we're gonna, it's going to be these three halogens that show up the most, but iodine shows up from time to time as well in organic chemistry. And we name them just by, with a prefix, just like any other branch. Um, and the reason that it's worth talking about how many bonds they want to form, if all of the halogens, they all have one vacancy in their, in their valence, right? They only need to gain one electron, which means they're always going to form one bond when they're, when they're neutral which means they effectively just replace a hydrogen. Hydrogens want to form one bond, can only form one bond, right? Some of the halogens, if we if you remember the cases where they could break the octet rule, sometimes we saw halogens that could have more than one bond and still be neutral. But for the most part, in organic chemistry, halogens are just going to replace a hydrogen. <laughs> and we just indicate where they are and what type of halogen it is, but with a prefix. So it's, um, instead of just having, if we ignore the halogen here, this would be methyl hexane, right? Three methyl hexane. If we have a chlorine on there too, we're just gonna throw chloro on the front. Right, so the parent molecule would be hexane. It's got a methyl group on carbon three, so it'd be three methyl hexane. And it's also got a chloro group on carbon two. I can't draw it too bad. It's really hard to draw it too from the bottom up. 
to fluoro-remethylhexane. So what do you suppose the prefix is for bromine? Bromo. Same general principle, find your longest con continuous carbon chain, which is still six in this case. This is also going to be a methyl hexane, but it's going to be a bromo methyl hexane. We just have to specify where they are. What's gonna be the best way to count for this one? Going to be bromo something and methyl something. Those two bromo. Two bromo, which would make that five methyl. Yeah, but would you want that or would you want the opposite? Do you want bromo to be the most? Does it matter? So that that's exactly the right approach. Is that is there is there a priority when it comes to determining what gets the lowest numbers? And the answer is yes. With bromines, with halogens and alkane branches, it doesn't really matter that much. Five methyl two bromohexane versus two methyl five bromohexane, you'll still draw the same molecule either way. But basically, anything that's not an alkane is more important. Than, than the alkane. We start from the base and every time we add something, that's gonna be more important than what came before it. So bromine is more important to have. And so we wanna make sure that bromo has as low a number as possible. And the methyl doesn't matter as much. How about this one right here? What's our longest continuous carbon chain? Four. Remember, there's no carbon there. That's just a fluorine. Okay. So three. So it's going to be methyl propane, right? If it's propane, do we need to specify where the methyl group is? You can't really put a methyl group on carbon one or carbon three of propane, because if you did, you'd just make it butane, right? But if you wanted to specify, you could say two methyl propane. Fluoro. Fluoro. And that doesn't have a prefix because it's at the top of the carbon chain. Could it be on carbon two? Does carbon two have a hydrogen that you could replace that you could swap with the fluorine? So you could have two fluoro, two methyl propane. So we do need to specify where the fluorine is. So one fluoro, two methyl propane. Yeah. You said that the halogen is replacing the hydrogen, but isn't it kind of replacing a carbon? There's still two more. There's carbons in the center. If you just had, if we just had methyl propane, the complete structure would look like this, right? There's methyl propane. If I want to make this fluoromethyl propane, I can't have, I can't just add a fluorine here like that, right? Because that gives me a uh, carbon with five bonds. So basically, we have to get rid of one of the hydrogens to add a fluorine. That's what I mean by it's replacing a fluorine, or sorry, replacing a hydrogen, because methyl propane, you think of the carbons as being like the, the backbone of the molecule, these functional groups, these other atoms that we're adding are basically like we're tacking them onto the existing carbon structure. The 
carbons are the, are the basis of everything else. And so if we want to take methylpropane and make it fluoromethylpropane, we have to do so by removing a hydrogen to make room for it. And we could put it right here instead and still have it be fluoromethylpropane, right? Because there was still a hydrogen on that carbon we could replace it with. And that's why we have to specify, even though it's on carbon one, we have to specify where the fluorine is because it could be on carbon two, and that would give us a different molecule. So the only time you don't need a prefix is if there's no possible way to draw that structure where you put your methyl group on a different carbon. You can't, it wouldn't be methyl propane if we put a carbon over here, because then we have four carbons in a row instead of three. No, it's not methyl propane, now it's butane. So that's why sometimes we don't have to specify, but when in doubt, write that number on there. It's better to be overly specific than to be ambiguous. Um, yeah. Wouldn't what we just did also be a complicated uh, branch? The circle at the bottom chain? So if we count it like that, you could name it that way. We would say that, and then you would have a fluoromethyl group. Two fluoromethyl in parentheses propane. You could name it that way. Because the, the halogens are higher in priority, we usually want to try to make sure they don't get put on a complicated branch. We want the longest continuous carbon chain that has the halogen directly attached to it is the better way of naming it. But as soon as we start adding other molecules in here and halogens aren't as important, we're going to wind up with some cases like that where it's like, well, I have to count this way because this is where my alcohol functional group is. And that means I have a chloromethyl complicated branch. But it's still using those, those parentheses is still the right way to go about it. It's still, it's a really powerful universal tool because as long as you can name it with a prefix, you can put it inside parentheses too. What's our longest continuous carbon chain here? Just two, which makes our parent molecule what? Ethane. Ethane. And it's got two chlorines on it. Dichloro. We have to specify where they are. Could you have one one dichloro ethane? Could you put both of the chlorines on the same carbon? Yeah. It is just one carbon or one chlorine. You don't have to specify because whichever chlorine the car the uh, whichever carbon the chlorine is on is carbon one. But as soon as you have two chlorines, you have to specify because they could be on the same carbon or uh, they could be on adjacent carbons. So it'd be two, two, or sorry, one, two. One, two dichloroethane, and two as opposed to one, one dichloroethane. Right, so it makes things a little more complicated, but it's not really any difference. It's just another wrinkle to keep track of, right? Still, so if I am the longest continuous carbon chain, name everything else with a prefix. Um, let's look at, we want to do some more practice with, with the uh, complicated branches, with the parentheses. Yeah, before we add on another wrinkle to it. All right, so I always found it, there's two ways to ask nomenclature questions. There's, here's a molecule, what's the name? There's also, here's the name, what's the molecule? I always found these ones easier because 
the, the name itself reminds you of how, how to do it sometimes, right? right? If you look at this name, like, what the heck is with the parentheses? And then you think about it for a second, like, oh yeah, that's how I do complicated branches. So use the test to help you uh, answer, answer your own questions, right? If you, I found these easier and I definitely go back, I numerous times when I was in OCHEM taking it as a student, I would go through this part of the nomenclature, get down here, be like, oh shoot, I forgot that that's what that means. Or I forgot that I had to sit right cis versus trans, or I forgot I had to do this or that. Use the this part of the test to remind you of some of the wrinkles you may have forgotten before. What's our longest continuous carbon chain for this guy here? Yeah, visually we can see it pretty easily, right? If you're not sure, start there, count how many that is, and then start going the other directions and see if you can get to the same number another way. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So that's going to be octane again, right? And octane with a complicated branch. Right, that complicated branch is an ethyl group that has on it a methyl. And the way to know if it's a complicated branch is if you start at the main molecule and you try to go to the end of the branch, if at any time there's two different directions you could go, it's a complicated branch. And you should be using parentheses. So in this case, our longest, the most steps we can take from the parent molecule would be two, right? One, two. So that's going to be an ethyl group that has on it a methyl group. Then we just specify which carbon is attached to. Or count from the bottom. We have one, two, three, four. Count the other direction, we get five. How about this one in the middle? There's nine in a row, so it's going to be no name. Oh, they said no name. I was like, what? You could be in for a round, wouldn't you? So how do we, what is that complicated branch then? Most steps you can take in two methyl maybe a methyl propyl. There's our methyl attached to it. Just one methyl propyl. And then just like before, we need to specify which carbon it's on. Carbon five. So five, one methyl propyl no name. Other than the fact that you have to draw the draw the structures and then copy and paste them into the file and mess with formatting, these are really easy to write. 
test questions for, right? Because there's really, with the rules you have already, there's really not a limit to how many different molecules I could draw and ask you to name already. And we've only added one functional group, which is just the halogens, right? But the thing is, is that they're all the same over and over again. It's the same process. Almost continuous carbon chain, name your branches. If you need to, use parentheses. Almost continuous carbon chain. So, so hexane. So hexane. And there's actually two different ways we can get there. That's hexane, right? Then so is that. Could you also start with the top one too? What are the top one? So really the blue one is like better though, right? Because it's a lot if, if we don't have a complicated branch, yeah. right? <laughs> We have three branches if we use the one that I circled in purple here, but they're all simple branches. There's a methyl group, an ethyl group, and a chloro group. If we go to the red one, we have only have two branches, but one of them is a methyl ethyl. There's a better option. Go to that way, or we circle the top one, that's going to give you the same name either way, though, right? So that's going to be hexyl, a hexane. Two methyl. Three ethyl. Four, and then five. What were you going to say, Sydney? Five Oh, sorry, man. Do you want, you want the lowest number? Yeah, the chlorine. So we'll just erase these. Keep the chlorine as low as possible. Do two chloro, four ethyl, five methyl. Here you go. Hopefully, it should start feeling a little repetitive at this point. We're still getting the hang of it, but still. You put four ethyl and one, or four methyl and one, and they're in different states, or because they're not in the same group? Mm -hmm. They're not in the same branch. You only use the parentheses if they're part, if it's a, if it was a methyl group on an ethyl group, you use the parentheses. For the percentage. But if they're separate branches, you don't use parentheses. Something else I was going to say about that, and it's totally escaping me now. Probably most important. All right, questions so far? Going the other direction. One of the reasons going the other direction is easy is because you get to decide how you're going to write your primary carbon chain, right? Because you don't need to write it twisted around like this. If it's heptane, just draw seven in a row. Trick with these is also to make sure with strong skeletal structures, the easiest place to confuse yourself um, is by miscounting. Because if you start by drawing the line, you say, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, actually just drew eight carbons. You have to say one when you put your pencil down because they're first carbon. Look at the nodes. Exactly. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And then you just add your branches, right? It doesn't really matter, but that was the other thing I was going to talk about. Okay, there's a methyl group. Then on carbon four, there's an ethyl group that has a methyl on it. And 
And because you're drawing your own molecule, you can draw your parent molecule in a straight line and you can count from left to right. It wouldn't be wrong to count from right to left, but you don't need to. So if you grew up speaking English or any Latin based language, you think of left to right mostly, might as well do that. Um, I've met people and taught people that liked to count from right to left, just to be contrary, I think, because they were English native speakers. And I don't know of any, maybe they were dyslexic. I don't know. I don't want to impose any value <laughs> judgments on that. There's no right answer. <laughs> I think left to right. I think most people think left to right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the other thing I was going to mention about this last one, we had. Two chloro, four ethyl, five methyl. So just on accident, I wrote them alphabetical order. You don't need to do that though, right? So technically, the, the textbook will tell you and we'll say that you need to have your, your prefixes in alphabetical order, not in, in numerical order. But again, because there's no agreement between textbooks about whether dimethyl is alphabetized as a D or alphabetized as an M, um, some textbooks will say if you put dimethyl, you still alphabetize it under M. And some textbooks say if you put dimethyl, all of a sudden that's a D and it goes in the middle. It's because there's a lack of agreement there, I'm not going to be picking it. Because they don't need to be in alphabetic order as long as they're all there with the proper numbers. About four two methyl propyl decade. Ten. Ten. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Part four, neither direction. What does a methyl propyl group look like? It doesn't matter. Start with propyl. On carbon four, draw a propyl group. One, two, three. Then on the second carbon of your propyl group, Draw methyl. This is another one though where if you count it from this direction, you can do it without having, you could still get a decade um, and not have to use parentheses. You count it like this. You get a two methyl four propyl decade. As opposed to four two methyl propyl decade. Start here and count. Uh, oh, you start. Oh, well, you're talking about a branch. Carbon one is the one that's directly attached to the, the trunk of the tree. So that's our decade, and that's our tree trunk. Carbon one of the branch is the part that's directly attached to the tree. So one, two, three. All right. I really like the parentheses method of naming complicated branches because it, it's really universal and involves very little memorizing. You know methyl, propyl, butyl, ethyl, then that's all you really need to be able to use this. However, there's an older way of naming complicated branches that I'm going to show you. I'm not going to really test you on it, but I want you to be aware of it because it shows up a lot in, bio, in biology. Um, because in biology, they're not as good about using the systematic thing. This, this method of naming that I've, I've taught you is called the IUPAC nomenclature, which stands for International Union of Practical and Applied Chemists. 
IUPAC is the governing body worldwide for tennis. They're the ones who decide what new elements are named. They're the ones who decide what is the quote unquote right way to name things. Um, and the IUPAC way of naming things uses these parentheses now. Biology, and I'm not going to just throw biologists under the bus entirely, but because it's not as central to their study, they tend to use the old school names more often. Um, and so they, you won't see these parentheses in, in a biology classroom on their on their chemistry bottle or chemical bottles. Typically, you will see what I'm about to show you, um, and you have seen it in other places too. Hardware stores and pharmacies still use the old school way of naming these things too. Um, so basically, if it, if it's a complicated branch, but it's a relatively common one, for instance, like a methyl ethyl is a really common, complicated branch. So common that it has its own name called an isopropyl group. So instead of saying methyl ethyl here, you could say four isopropyl ethyl. But that relies on you knowing what isopropyl is. And it's not as universal a system. Right, so an isopropyl group is an ethyl that has a methyl attached, as opposed to an n-propyl group. An n-propyl group means that it's in a straight line. N means linear in organic chemistry. Um, you can also have an isobutyl group, which is four carbons arranged where you have this sort of identical, you have two different routes you could take from, from here to get to the end. Why they use the term ISO, meaning the same. Um, but then again, with a, with a four carbon branch, there's actually like four different ways you can arrange. With the three carbon branch, there's only two ways you can arrange it. It could be a methyl ethyl group, or it could be a straight chain propyl group. With four carbons, you can have an isobutyl, but you could also have a secbutyl that looks like this, or you could also have a tert-butyl group that looks like that. I don't like these because it feels more like memorizing, and then if you get something that's not one of the ones you have memorized, what do you do with it? If you know how to use the parentheses, there is no complicated branch I can give you that you can't just apply the same logic you're used to, the same process that you've already learned. So I'm showing you these so that you know they exist. And then we're going to take our break and I'm never going to use them again. <laughs> okay. All right, let's take our break. Let's come back at five after. And we'll add a couple more wrinkles and then some other functional groups.
We don't get to do it right on the solstice. Okay. We're just as close as we can. Okay. Yeah. Well, you buy that shirt? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you buy that shirt? Are you skipping it? I bought it. I didn't want to ask for it. Yeah, yeah, pretty sure. I, mean, yeah. I was working out at work yesterday. Yeah. My brother's not opening it. My brother's like, yeah, she she eats parts. Yeah, but she lost so many clothes that are yeah. Like I need to start eating them out. Like yeah, like you can find it. I lost so many clothes. I never. I just throw them away. I never have to do that again. And he knows it. He is He is a bitch. That's true. Chips, you know. Is John is our sort presenting next Thursday, right? Is it during the thirty lecture? Yeah. And then the final is on the following Thursday. Correct. Right. We will be on the day. 
Yeah. Uh, we've done stuff like that before, but I'm not thinking clearly right now. So it's, yeah, let me let me try to remember all the people's involved with that because usually what we do is use the Tuesday before as a review session. Right. You need a proper Tuesday. So you need a proper. So we can probably work something out. It might be during the lab time instead of the lecture time. But we can find something that works. Like, yeah, I'm just doing it. That would be so I feel like it's nice to have the extra two days that way for sure. For right now, you know, uh, yeah, ask, ask me, remind me on Tuesday of next week. Yeah, the test is on Thursday, the test is two weeks from today, the presentation is a week from today. Is that your question, too? No, okay. Tuesday finals week. We don't officially meet, so it's a review session. Wait, we're going on Thursday next week. Hang, hang on one sec. My brain is playing If you want to take it, um, if you want to take it Tuesday of finals week at the SAS, then then that's fine. Um, that just gives me a deadline to make sure it's written by then. <laughs> Sorry, on a gut. Sorry, I worded it out. That was very rude, actually. So we're presenting Thursday next week? Yeah. Presenting a week from today. The final is the following Thursday? The final is the following Thursday. There won't be a take home component to this final. It'll all just be in class, but it's going to be, it's not going to be like the other tests we've had in this class because it's, I don't want to say less skills based, but it's less mathematical. We haven't really covered anything mathematical since we since we took the midterm, right? We talked about coordination compounds, and then we started getting into and talked about semiconductors and stuff. But it's all conceptual vocab based stuff. So it's going to be the test is going to kind of be arranged that way as well. So the midterm, or sorry, the test is midterm in after. Midterm in, in after. Um, because really the midterm in this class is more like the, the capstone of all the stuff we've been learning, right? All of the math stuff we went that went into it was was on the midterm. Um, all the stuff we've covered since then is kind of like special topic stuff, stuff that you need to know a little bit, but not that it has any math that we haven't already done. No ice tables though. No ice tables <laughs> for the first time in a, in a while. And uh, you know, honestly, I don't think there's much math at all. It's going to be some some no organic nomenclature stuff. Some like um, you know, arrange arrange these in order of most conductive to least conductive, or identify which one is a semiconductor and which one's an insulator out of these options. Um, you you know, draw a structure for a, a coordination compound. Um, but other than other than that. It's, it's all it's all going to be concept driven. All right, so let's let's add the one one more wrinkle before we get into more into uh, true functional groups. Um, is it with it still being just a regular alkane? You can the one other wrinkle we can have is that if we have our our carbons linked in a ring structure instead of being in a what we call a straight chain alkane. Um, and the easy, it's a really easy prefix, really self-evident. We just say cyclo. If it's a, if it's a group of carbons in a ring, um, whether we're naming it as the parent molecule or if it's a um, branch, um, we just say cyclo. So this is cyclohexane. Um, and cyclohexane is just six carbons arranged in a ring. If we had six carbons arranged in a ring, but not all of them were in the ring, that's a cycloalkane as well, but it's not cyclohexane. What's the longest continuous carbon chain? 
right? Is the, the number of carbons in the ring is five. So this is cyclopentane with a branch. So this is methyl cyclopentane. What am I trying to describe when the branch was? Where would you count from on the, on the ring? If it's just one thing, then all of these carbons are identical. So you don't need a name. You don't need to say where it is. Exactly. If there's two of them, now all of a sudden they could be adjacent to each other or they could be one apart from each other, right? So in this case, we'd say one, two dimethyl cyclopentane. Or if it was down here, that'd be one, three dimethyl cyclopentane. And, but the, one of the things to pay attention to is you can't count, it's kind of a confusing way of wording it, this is the best way I've found it. You never count into or out of the ring. When you're counting how many carbons are in the ring or what your longest continuous carbon chain is, I mean, the argument could be made that the longest continuous carbon chain here is six, right? Because you could still go one, two, three, four, five, six. That's against the rules. The ring is its own thing. Either the ring is your longest continuous carbon chain or whatever is attached to the ring is your longest continuous carbon chain. The ring is never part of a larger carbon chain, if that makes any sense. You don't count into the ring or out of the ring. So for in one of the, one of the ones that's confusing that way, So if I had what's my longest continuous carbon chain? Six, because we don't count into the ring. And so we have five that are in the ring, or we have six across the top, not a combination of the two. So in this case, this would be still be hexane, just like before. And it's hexane that has a branch. How do we name that branch? Methyl hexane? Not quite. If it didn't have this at all, yeah, it was, so it would be four methyl. What would this be if it was just five carbons in a ring? Cyclopentane. Cyclopentane. If it's got five carbons in a ring and it's a branch, instead of being cyclopentane, it's a cyclopental group. The branch has five carbons in a ring, so it's cyclo. Pentyl hexane. And again, with the using the hyphens, technically, this is would all be one word cyclopentyl hexane. But that starts getting really confusing, right? Do we need to specify where the cyclopentyl group is attached? Do you have one cyclopentyl hexane? This is this is the case where you can have an alkane as your branch on carbon one without making the overall carbon chain longer, right? Because the ring is its own separate thing. If we And that molecule instead. Now, what's our longest continuous carbon chain? Or what's our parent molecule? So now the parent par molecule is cyclopentane. Like 
I don't know why I never feel compelled to put a hyphen between cyclo when using it as a prefix. I do between every other prefix out there, but I don't put a hyphen in between cyclo. And other things I won't mark you down when you do though. So then what's the pre what is the prefix we'd use to name this branch? Ethyl. Ethyl group. Yeah, so two, because there's two of them. With a methyl group attached, right? That makes it a methyl ethyl. Methyl ethyl cyclopentane. Do we need to specify where it is? Because whatever carbon has the methyl ethyl approach attached to it is carbon. Any, anybody remember the other name for a methyl ethyl group? Isopropyl. Isopropyl. Could call this isopropyl cyclopentane. Like I said, I don't tend to use those prefixes because once you get the hang of it, it doesn't even, isopropyl versus methyl ethyl doesn't even save you any syllables, right? It saves you a couple letters when you're writing it out, but it doesn't really save you any time. And the parentheses are so much more universal and um, powerful of a tool. That's it. Well, like, the box one, why was it switched to cyclopentyl and not the main? Because if it's Here's an example. Here, where our longest continuous carbon chain, we can either, if we have five in a row, we could make this our parent molecule, right? But in this case, our longest continuous carbon chain is one, two, three, four, five here. And then we have all of the branches attached to the same parent molecule, right? If we try, we could technically, Maybe this is our parent molecule, and then this is just a really complicated branch. We might have to use parentheses within parentheses to do that. It's doable, but it'll be a lot simpler if we made this our parent molecule. Right? And, and sometimes you don't get a choice. If this was one carbon longer, if it was six in a row, and we had a cyclopentyl group attached to it, we have to go with the longest continuous carbon chain, which is six, not five. And then it being the parent uh, chain or the branch is the difference. Of, uh, exactly. Why L means it's you're using that as a prefix. Oh. And A and E means that's the parent mole. So we're going to continue naming this campaign. It has a chlorine attached to it, a cyclopentyl group attached to it, and a methyl attached to it. So we're just going to throw three prefixes on it. Two chloro. Three cyclopentyl. And the end button. And that would make that four methyl. Again, cyclo is another one of those ones to use to alphabetize this as under C for cyclo or under P for pentyl. And textbooks will disagree on that. So don't worry about it. 
main thing is that's an unambiguous name. You can't have this name and get to the wrong structure. Any questions so far? All right, so let's talk about alkanes and their properties for just a second. Would we expect alkanes to mix well with water? Why not? They're all nonpolar, right? What are our two criteria for polar or for a molecule to be polar? Exactly. We need polar bonds, and then after that, we also need asymmetry. Good. If it's a hydrocarbon, it lacks <laughs> polar bonds. That's the easiest thing to check. If it's all carbons and hydrogens, carbon and hydrogen is not a polar bond. So it doesn't matter if it has asymmetry. Most all of our organic molecules are going to be asymmetric. Because as soon as you start having more than one central atom linked in a row, they're pretty much always going to be asymmetric somewhere. Yeah. However, you still need polar bonds. And that's exactly what we see. Um, there's a reason that that everybody knows the term octane, right? Octane refers to what? Fuel. Fuel. What happens when you spill gasoline on the ground or on a puddle? Oil and horses. Yeah. Uh, I had that thing. I think I took that. Well, like in water, you have like these mats. When you spill oil, uh, it like sucks it up. Right. It sits on the. Exactly. You put a uh, a piece of um, a specific material. It's not quite. You can use cloth, but it doesn't work as well. Um, that basically preferentially absorbs non-polar liquids more than polar liquids. Marinas. Yeah, marinas. Um, they have them at gas stations too if you, um, to try and keep gasoline out of the groundwater, but nobody goes and gets it if you just spill a few drops, right? Um, but if you're at the, in the marina in the Keys or something and you're trying to, to fill up, uh, you spill some gas in the water, then you go get those things. They, it's like mopping the surface of water. Um, because we're trying to keep keep out uh, alkanes and other nonpolar stuff out of the way. <clears throat> um, does anybody know what the octane rating is then? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, like a percentage of how much energy that fuel has compared to octane. So eighty nine. Octane rating means it has 89% the energy density as true octane. Um, gasoline in general is a mixture of a bunch of different molecules because a lot of times, and you'll actually see this if you look in the flammable cabinet um, in our stock room, we have a bottle that just says hexanes, plural. It's just a mixture of all, of all carbons or uh, hydrocarbons that have this formula um, C6H14. All the different isomers that have that formula, whether it's methyl pentane, whether it's dimethyl butane, um, they, they all go, they all have about the same boiling point. So if, if you just need a cheap solvent, um, you can buy hexanes, plural. And that's basically what, what gasoline is. Gasoline's a mixture of a bunch of different isomers. Um, and they don't bother separating them out because all you're going to do is burn it anyway, right? It doesn't really matter if you're burning pure octane or if you're burning a mixture of octane and methyl heptane if they have the same energy density. So they just rate those different gasoline blends you can get based on, you know, how much energy does it have. Diesel's different? Diesel's different. Diesel has a higher energy density, but it burns at a lower temperature and slower. Um, and so that's why diesel engines have to be designed differently. It's because of 
of the type, the composition of diesel fuel causes it to burn slower. It's still nonpolar, it's still mold, um, it's still immiscible with water, but it has, it's a little bit more viscous. Cleaner. It's typically cleaner. You get better diesel engines there. It's not just a matter of taking the same engine and tweaking it. It actually has a different structure to it, which is why you can't just sub fuels back and forth. Um, the diesel cycle is just is actually built differently and is able to extract more energy from burning fuels as kinetic motion compared to uh, a Carnot cycle, which is the cycle that you get from a, a traditional a gasoline burning um, internal combustion engine. You take PCHEM, uh, which is physical chemistry. You actually have to, you need to take uh, multivariable calc first, but you basically do the math to show the difference. It's an integral problem um, where you look at the, the different types of, they call it the different strokes. A diesel engine is two stroke, meaning it, ha it has one specific type of motion that it makes back and forth. A, a four stroke engine is anything that'll run on gasoline. And the four stroke engines are not as efficient, but they're easier to maintain and build. And that's when you start talking about dirt bikes. And, that's when you, and then dirt bikes are closer to a diesel engine in terms of their structure. And that's why you have to add that. Um, Adding the oil to it. Um, that it's basically, it's kind of like taking gasoline and causing it to mimic some of the properties of diesel. Um, it's not quite the same. Those are, they're still not as efficient as the true diesel engine, but a two stroke engine is closer to a diesel engine than it is to a, a regular um, gasoline engine. If I'm remembering, I am, I am not thinking clearly, and it's been a long time since I took that class, so I could be mixing up some specifics there. You so check me on that. Two stroke engines in the lake, right? Correct, because, because they, part of those two strokes is that they, they lubricate their cylinders. By using that additive, um, and they they yeah the premix stuff, um, and they it doesn't keep it as isolated from the water around it, and so you wind up leaking oil more in, with can, a two-stroke engine. You can see it on the dirt bike if you put a two-stroke and a four-stroke after you've ridden them. You can see the oils from the two-stroke like on the dirt. A mess to try yeah. to clean up, but it gets all over your bike and everything. Right. Um, and when you when your engine is submerged in the water as a way to cool it down, or it's drawing water through it to cool it down instead of being air cooled or um, having a cooling system, then you wind up just putting that right in the water. Um, all right. So if they're non-polar, what do we know about boiling points? Think back to intermolecular forces. If they're nonpolar, what type of intermolecular forces do we have? Do we have hydrogen bonding? No. No? No, we don't. We don't have ion dipole bonding either because there's no ions, right? Hydrogen bonding meant you had an oxygen, an oxygen, fluorine, fluorine, or nitrogen directly attached to a hydrogen. You get that big difference in electronegativity specifically to a hydrogen. So no hydrogen bonding, no ion dipole bonding. Vanderbilt? Yeah, there's always Van der Waals, right? That's the one that's always there, the London dispersion forces. Is there dipole dipole? What does dipole mean? Difference in charges. Difference in charges. So if it's a polar molecule, it's a dipole. Yeah. If it's a non-polar molecule, do we have a dipole? So the only forces we have are Van der Waals. Anybody remember when Van der Waals forces got stronger versus weaker? I don't remember hearing that term. I always remember. London dispersion oh, forces okay. means the same thing. So sorry, dispersion forces. When do dispersion forces get stronger? No. I mean, yes, there's always more attractive forces because the molecules bump into each other more on high pressure. When they get bigger, when you have more electrons, you get more dispersion forces. The easiest way to track more electrons is to look at, look at molecular weight. Higher molecular weight is pretty much always going to be more electrons. 
because if you have more high, higher molecular weight, that almost always means more protons, right? If the overall molecule is neutral, like all the organic compounds we've looked at, higher molecular weight also means more electrons. So if you want to know what's going to have a higher boiling point, you just look at which one's bigger. So ethane. But butane versus propane. Okay. Butane. Don't a lot of these molecules have, like, or all of them have hydrogen attached to them? So I, I, I think I'm just forgetting how hydrogen bonds work. So a hydrogen bond specifically is water. stronger than a regular um, intermolecular force, a regular uh, dipole dipole attraction, because hydrogen doesn't have any core electrons, right? It only has valence electrons. Okay. And so if you if you attach a hydrogen to a really electronegative element, which we list as nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, or chlorine, if you have a hydrogen in a covalent bond with any of those four, the fact that it doesn't have any four electrons means that the, the nucleus of that hydrogen is almost exposed, which results in a really, really strong partial positive. So Hydrogen bonds are basically a type of polar bond where specifically it's a hydrogen attached to an oxygen or attached to a nitrogen or fluorine or fluorine. Um, and so because that makes such a strong partial positive, you get stronger intermolecular forces that way. So like if you had water, the partial positives on both of these hydrogens are going to be stronger partial positives than if it was oxygen to a carbon. Gotcha. Even though carbon and hydrogen are almost the same in terms of electronegativity, the fact that it's hydrogen makes it unique. Okay. So, and that means that hydrocarbons don't have, there are carbon hydrogen bonds, but there are not hydrogen bonds in the terms of intermolecular forces because you don't get a hydrogen attached to something really electronegative. When I was first learning this, I actually, this was actually my go-to way of remembering which of these, um, which prefix went with which number of carbons. Propane should have a lower boiling point than butane because it's only three carbons instead of four carbons, which is kind of, and I, if you use a butane lighter versus cooked with propane, propane is a gas at room temperature. Butane is a liquid at room temperature, right? So that's that's the way that when I was first learning this, I would keep propane pro versus butte straight. I knew butte was bigger because butane is a liquid at room temperature and propane is not. I don't have a comparable one for meth methane versus ethane. I'm sorry, but propane versus butane, you can keep straight if you know what a but that a butane lighter has, is liquid and propane is not. Ethane. Butane has a higher Butane is going to have a higher boiling point. Then have a higher boiling Correct. And propane is going to be higher than ethane or methane. Yeah. So if you just remember, like, before, what's the prefix with R? Which one has the higher? Exactly. Okay. Sorry, I thought methane was bigger than ethane, so it has no. So methane is smaller than ethane. Okay. Methane, methane is one. one. When you, when they pump propane into um, a cylinder, is that liquid? Do they do it at a cooler temperature they, then? They do it at higher pressure. <laughs> but yes, it is. If you pick up a propane tank and shake it, you can hear it sloshing around because it's under pressure. But if you, as soon as you let it out of that, it's a gas at room temperature at atmospheric pressure. Butane too. Butane is a liquid at room temperature barely. It's, it evaporates, it boils really just below room temperature, but you can see it as a liquid more commonly than propane. All right, we talked about saturated versus unsaturated in that formula the other day. Um, here's another example. Here's a real world molecule, acetylene. Has a formula C2H2. Does anybody know what he used acetylene for? Torches, welding. 
Um, acetylene torch is one is what you uh, what you cut metal with. You don't have a plasma cutter. Um, if the formula for acetylene is C two H two, what's the structure going to look like? How can we have a stable structure where everything has a formal charge of zero? The level bond. Still not enough bond on my carbon, right? Triple bond. Ethylene. The the IUPAC name for it is actually ethene. Looks like this. Ethylene gets used. To, it's a plant hormone. Um, it actually causes plants to ripen, causes fruit to ripen. Um, and so that's actually how they how they transport tomatoes without bruising the tomatoes. And same with apples. So they transport them before they're ripe, when they're still green, because when the fruit's green before it's ripe, it's a lot firmer, right? It's a lot more resistant to being bruised. And when you get it to, to the store, you put it with other fruit that's... that's uh, Sometimes it's going bad, but sometimes they just actually use a tank of ethylene. And when you expose green fruit to ethylene, it causes the fruit to ripen. So that's the difference between a vine ripened tomato and a and a non vine ripened tomato. Is a non vine ripened tomato got to the store as a green tomato, and then they exposed it to ethylene. Nothing inherently wrong with that, but people fall into the naturalistic fallacy a lot with organic chemistry meaning that they, they make the assumption that if it's natural, it's better. Um, it's not necessarily the truth. There are some aspects where that's, that's the case, but there's lots of cases, especially in organic chemistry, where there's zero difference between synthetic versus natural. Synthetic just means they made it in the lab. Natural means that it grew, and then they purified it somehow, like doing a steam distillation. Um, if you can make the same molecule, it doesn't really matter which way you make it. It's going to be the same molecule with the same properties for the most part. Sorry, personal personal pet peeve of mine is when people make the, they go through the, the naturalistic fallacy. Well, it's natural, it's got to be healthy. You know what else is natural? It's arsenic. Yeah, they can have it. It's pretty healthy if you want someone to die. <laughs> I think that's what they're trying to do with uh, phenogenic compounds because, like, a lot of them come up from the endangered species. They're trying to say it's the same compound. You don't right. need to push these off like you know, exactly. Yeah. It's the difference. People make Let's also make the, the assumption that like like lime, like um wild caught salmon is better than farm raised salmon. It's way worse for the environment because farm raised salmon is actually way more sustainable than if you think about like hunting elk versus um you know cows that we're raising. I'm sure, there's a lot of issues with raising. Raising uh, animals in general in, in factory farms and that kind of thing. But in general, it's more sustainable to farm something than it is to go out and pick it in nature, right? If enough people go out and try and catch wild fish, fish populations depleted and they go extinct. You can farm them and, and feed people that way. That's actually a better option. But people don't think of that that way because the naturalistic balance, oh, they caught it in the wild. It's, Safer, it's better for you, it's better for the environment. Um, not always the case. Anyway. Um, these are two examples of other functional groups. If you have carbon-carbon pi bonds, instead of just being saturated hydrocarbon, like Ethane. Ethane looks like this. The fact that that acetylene uh, and ethylene have these carbon-carbon pi bonds means they react differently. Pi bonds inherently are different and have different energies and different interactions with their surroundings than ethane. Ethane is the main component in natural gas. Acetylene is used in welding torches. You can't use um, ethane in an acetylene torch because it doesn't burn the same way. Is acetylene the IUPAC name? No. 
So the IUPAC name for both of these are a little different. They both use the same base where you say, okay, it's two carbons, therefore it's F. Except that they're, this is not an alkene anymore. When you add a carbon-carbon pi bond, it changes it. it makes it, if it's um, a double bond between two carbons, we call this an alkene instead of an alkane. And if it's an alkene instead of an alkane, what do you suppose the name ends in? In. So instead of saying um, ethane, ethane versus ethene. So is acetylene also ethyne? Exactly. So this is an alkyne. If it's a triple bond, it's an alkyne. So we name it ethyne. So this is gonna be the number one way that we indicate what functional groups we have. It's not something we name with a prefix like a halogen or a branch. We do it by amending the ending. Instead of ethane, you get ethene or ethyne. Which, that's a perfect lead up to the next slide. Alkenes have a single pi bond. Alkynes have two pi bonds between the same carbon, so a triple bond. So we're naming these same rules as before. The only difference is now we want to find the longest carbon chain that contains the pi bond. So now it's not just about the longest carbon chain period, it's the longest carbon chain that has the pi bond or the double pi bond. And then we just name it the same way, except instead of adding aim, we use either in or ein. So for instance, what's our longest continuous carbon chain for this molecule? Four. Four. So that's gonna be butte. And aim or ein? So the butene instead of butane. Basically, IUPAC organic nomenclature is a, you know, if you put the scientists in charge of developing a language from scratch, every single word, every single letter in a word means something basically, right? Um, you'll see that we can convey a huge amount of information in a really small space. Um, if we, if we use the proper nomenclature. There is one issue though, and that's the shape of a pi bond. Pi bonds inherently limit how much these things can rotate around. Sigma bonds, sigma bonds are the bonds that look like this, right? Where you had complete overlap between the two, between the two um, atoms. And one aspect of this is it's rotationally symmetric, meaning it can twist around at will, right? Because there's nothing about this that prevents something from rotating into the board or out of the board. It still has just as much orbital overlap, right? Because it's symmetric that way. If we have a pi bond above and below that, now what happens if I take this and try to twist it? It's going to hit, basically it's going to break the pi bond. So if the pi bond is better drawing than I can do freehand. If the pi bond looks like this, the sigma bond is still there. It's still right in between these two, but again, rotationally symmetric all the way around. So this can twist around however it wants. The pi bond though, you can't twist these without completely severing that orbital overlap. So you basically, in order for it to rotate, you have to break the pi bond. And if you have to break the bond to go from one rotation to, the, to rotate at 180 degrees, that means that you're limiting things and basically you have two different molecules. These two molecules are both butene. More specifically, they're both 
to butene. So we do still have to specify where that double bond is because you can have two butene or you could have one butene. The number in this case is specifying where the pi bond is. And by convention, we only say the first number. Technically, it's between carbons two and three, but we don't say two, three butene. We just say two butene with the understanding that it's between carbon two and carbon three. And this would be one butene, which means that the pi bond is between carbon one and carbon two. There's something else I was going to say about that. Man, that's where we're going. So that's that's the difference between these two. These are both two butene. But because you actually have to break the pi bond to go from one to the other, it actually takes a significant amount of energy, more energy that you have than you have freely available at, at room temperature. So basically, you can't get these molecules to switch back and forth. They look like they're the same molecule. Pi bond is in the same place between carbons two and three, right? The same formula. However, they have different boiling points. Not by much, they're still pretty close. They have some other properties that are significantly different in terms of how they react. So to indicate which of these isomers we have, we just use the prefixes cis versus trans. Obviously, cis, cis and trans mean different things now than they did when I first, first learned this. That wasn't in common language. Um, but this is where that term comes from, cis versus trans. Trans means across or changing. Cis means the same on both sides. So in this case, this molecule is the trans version because the two carbons, the biggest parts of this molecule, the main branches, are sticking in opposite directions. This molecule, both the methyl groups, both of the carbons are sticking down the same general direction from that molecule, which makes this cis. And this is trans. And so that's, and we also use this in terms of cyclobers. If you think of cyclohexane, you usually draw cyclohexane as a hexagon. One advantage of taking organic chemistry is you get really good at drawing um, freehanding hexagons and pentagons really quickly. Each of these carbons, though, is still tetrahedral, right? So if this carbon is tetrahedral. That means that the other two, the two hydrogens attached to it, one sticking out of the board and one's going into the board. Can this freely rotate? Can I take this and twist it around however I want? Not without breaking one of these bonds to do it, right? So for the same reason as pi bonds, as alkenes, rings also have cis and trans. If I draw a cyclohexane, it's dimethyl cyclohexane. That's one three dimethyl cyclohexane. I have to specify that both of those methyl groups are pointing out, are pointing in the same direction. Versus Those are both one three dimethyl cyclohexane, right? This one's trans and this one's cis. All right, so it takes a little getting used to. Um, we're going to skip the part of organic chemistry that normally, if we had a whole like two weeks just to do organic chemistry, we'd talk more about reactions and things like that. Um, we're going to not spend 
not going to do that um, this this year because I'm just I didn't leave us enough time for that. So we're just going to focus on getting the nomenclatures and structures, and then we'll talk a little bit on Tuesday about other functional groups. We'll expand beyond this, um, not in terms of things that we'll, that we're going to name because. Very quickly, we get into here's a list of all of the different functional groups that you have to know when you take organic chemistry. We'll add them one at a time, basically. But I think it's your everybody here will be better served by getting a nice solid handle on the basics of nomenclature rather than trying to cover all of this. Um, because there's different ways. So far, we've done we've done these. Not even in much detail because we didn't talk about reactions, right? Um, then there's alcohols, ethers, epoxides. Oh, we did we did halogens as well. But then, so we did four out of the twenty one that are on this list, um, and not even in much depth. That we went pretty quickly through them, right? So organic chemistry is going to be all of these. We just start adding them a little bit at a time, but it's always with the same naming structures. All we're doing, if you look at this. Is it just has a list of okay? Here's the different ways you can name this, or here's the way you name it, and it's just like, here's a different new suffix that means this. Here's a new suffix that means this, and it's so it's basically building up your vocabulary over an entire year. Um, what the way I'm going to test you? We're going to talk about this quickly on Tuesday. Um, but the way I'm going to test one is basically I'm going to show you this and ask you to match it to a word bank on the test. Okay, is this an alcohol or is it maltine? Right, and so it's going to be glorified multiple choice where you just need to know the vocabulary and what's the group of atoms that go with that name, not how to name everything. All right, but we'll go over that on Tuesday and then we'll get into some basics of biochemistry and that's all of the new material. We have one lecture of new material left. Because next Thursday is your poster presentation. So. <laughs>